than, than this uh, topic today. I think many of us organizationally and personally have committed to um, listening more carefully about the reality of systemic racism that pervades our communities and our institutions. And uh, we are going to hear from four very important uh, leaders of color today on that, on that, on that very topic. Um, so I do have a couple of logistical observations, and then I'll turn it over to, to, to Dan to get us going here. Uh, we are, we always say it, it uh, on these virtual programs, we're at the mercy of, of Wi-Fi connections and technology. So hopefully, uh, so far we've, we've held up. So hopefully that will be the, the case today. But if there are any issues, we'll try to troubleshoot those. This conversation will be recorded and posted on the Downtown Council YouTube channel. If uh, at a future date, you'd like to go back and, and listen to what is said today. And if you do have questions uh, that you'd like to pose to the panelists, please use the Q&A function that's part of the, the Zoom technology here. And one other quick announcement from, from the Downtown Council, we do have uh, another program coming up, if we can go to that slide on, uh, Mary Beth, on June 24th, we'll be hearing from uh, industry leaders as they tell us about their plans to kind of operate safely in the uh, COVID-19 era. There we go. Well, that hasn't left us either. And so we need to also return to that discussion about how we're going to reanimate and reactivate downtown from an economic and business perspective in a safe and secure way, uh, given the public health concerns that uh, still exist for, for all of us. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Collison, my colleague who has been doing tremendous work in uh, the space of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion on, beha on behalf of our organization, and he's going to conduct the program from here. So thank you all for joining us, and, and Dan, turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Steve, and thank you for the opening comments and framing. And as I've taken time to speak with dozens and dozens of leaders, and uh, particularly a roundtable of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, executive practitioners, uh, what has led to this forum and the four leaders we are so privileged to hear from today um, has uh, continued to place, I think, the business community and all sectors onto some new trajectories and to some new frameworks of thinking that can indeed move us forward in this moment that is both uh, born of collective pain, but also of some possibility. And so for this forum and for our shared partnership between the East Town Business Partnership and the Downtown Council, thank you to Steve Kramer and to all who are a part of both organizations. I have just a couple of announcements, uh, particularly for those who are tracking with East Town Business Partnership. Um, we do a business forum series every year, kicks off in September, goes through June. In fact, this is the last one of the previous season. We just have historically for 40 years tracked with the school year. And so uh, while we're off in July and August as a business association, we'll still be working. Uh, and we just anticipate coming back together and doing some shared forums at Downtown Council. What you see here, it's also on our website, is the framework for the next series. Uh, and I'm not going to go through all the topics, but I'll just mention that we're really trying to dig into not only the lived realities that COVID-19 has presented, but also what we know to be ongoing and important priorities. So we're going to look at startup and small business communities. We're going to look at uh, the restaurants and bars and the hospitality industry that has been so deeply affected and will take a few years to recover. And we're also going to focus on some really marquee types of uh, properties and, and construction projects that are opening up in the air. So pay attention, uh, they're always free. Um, and when we do get back together, uh, they're only for the cost of the meals and it's very inclusive and approachable. Next slide, please. I also wanna highlight for those who are in the hospitality industry, uh, I am personally uh, helping to organize a bar and restaurant reopen collaborative, a food hospitality task force, and uh, have been leading in partnership, and I'll highlight one of our speakers today, Rosemary Uboaja, is a part of the Chameleon Consortium. This is all about uh, hospitality and retail, and, and particularly with diverse business activation. And so if you're interested, or you're an operator, or you are an owner of a bar and restaurant, uh, please reach out to me in the East Town area. We are organizing and doing everything we can to highlight your patios and partial open, and as you begin to do that, please let me know so we can collaborate together. And I like to say, coopetate, a, co a spirit of coopetition. Next slide, please. 
I also want to highlight uh, there are many things going on uh, downtown, and I've even heard from so, some hoteliers that uh, some folks are coming downtown and they're taking a couple day getaways, and so they're seeing a little bit of an uptick, which is fabulous. The farmers market's going to be going on through October. They have uh, incredible uh, farm to table types of amenities and options. Uh, please continue to engage in that. It's very active and it's very much relevant. Next slide, please. Dan, I'm just going to break in um, and just say a few people are saying that they've lost audio um, and I'm not quite sure what's going on there. It's not everybody. So I would check your, your own, uh, well, you probably can't hear me. I'm typing answers to people, but I just wanted to mention that there seems to be some audio issues for so, some folks. Okay, um, well, I've just switched from in-ear to computer. I don't know if that will help or not, um, but I'll just keep going. Can you all hear me now? I can hear you just fine, Dan, and I think folks are just logging off and back in and that's fixing it. Okay, great. Uh, so just continuing, we have many organizations that are in the downtown sector that are doing incredible work uh, in support of those most vulnerable. In the East Town Business Partnership, I wanna highlight Catholic Charities, House of Charity, and People Serving People. You can see links here. There's ongoing work, tremendous efforts, uh, to support those who are most vulnerable. Please continue to support them. Next slide. The MRA is an organization that's providing a ton of free HR resources. They have free webinars, free coaching, and free materials. Please connect with them, uh, particularly as you're exploring HR issues in the COVID-19 uh, moment. Next slide, please. Our neighborhood associations in East Town include the Downtown Minneapolis Neighbor Association and Elliott Park Neighborhood. Uh, we are just so uh, focused on celebrating our neighborhoods and their boards. Uh, the East Town Business Partnership or East Downtown area uh, is all about these neighborhoods. And so I recommend you continue to learn to know and understand how their boards form organizational programming, how they connect all of the residents who are here to that's going, what's going on downtown. This is a list of board meetings and land use committee meetings. And uh, we invite you to participate in all that they have going, which is vitally important. Next slide, please. So the city of Minneapolis, of course, is very active in doing a lot of engagement pieces in the next three slides, and I'll be very brief on this. They're doing a survey on non-emergency crimes. Please track with this, provide your input. Clearly, all of us are working on the issues of public safety, and this is one way you can weigh in as to how you express your needs and your business needs to the city of Minneapolis. Next slide, please. Councilmember Fletcher uh, is uh, seeking to open up conversation, and he's obviously done a lot of writing, including a Time Magazine opinion piece, and is active in engaging uh, neighborhood associations. And this is another way you can directly connect with him uh, with meetings. So please, we invite you to do so and engage, particularly on the public safety conversation that is a very important one right now. And then finally, the last slide, will point to all small businesses uh, I know the leadership of the small business office at the city very well. They are coordinated, they are organized, they are available, and they're engaged. And so please use this as a resource. This isn't just like a broad number that no one picks up. They're, they're doing incredible work and they can do a lot of solutions, provide a lot of solutions for what you're looking for in this moment. Um, so please resource that. So today, uh, I am so thrilled to have a conversation with uh, four leaders that I consider colleagues, I consider friends, I consider mentors, and they are leaders of color who come from very different sectors, uh, but bring together uh, a sense of voice, a sense of being in this moment, and uh, they include Kevin Lindsay, who is the CEO of the Minnesota Humanities Center. He's the former state of Minnesota Commissioner of Human Rights. Rosemary Uboaja, who is the CEO of NECA Creative. Jamika Quillen, who's Assistant Vice President, Human Resources and Inclusion and Associate Director, Office of Minority and Women Inclusion for the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis, and Liliana Maria Percy Ruiz, who's the executive producer of On Being, which is an incredible media company in Loring Park, for those who may not know. Well, I've asked all of them to just give a couple minutes each to explain uh, their, their title a little bit, a little bit about their organization. And I want to highlight, I want to give Rosemary a little bit of a special dispensation here because in this moment I know a lot of businesses are looking for really practical handles 
in ways that they can uh, change, they can, they can refocus their messaging and, and understand audience in this moment. And so I just want to highlight to give her a little extra time because Nika Creative has been a huge partner with the Community Consortium and they are experts in inclusionary marketing. Uh, but why don't we end up with her last. Let's start with Kevin Lindsay. Uh, please give us a quick uh, introduction. So Dan, thank you very much. Steve, also thank you for making the space available. And that's a good idea to have Rosemary uh, back clean up so she can hit a home run. <laughs> um, Minnesota Humanities Center uh, is an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our vision is to create a just society that is curious, connected, and compassionate. Curious that people come to conversations with an open heart and open mind. Connected, as Dr. King talks about, seeing mutuality in a common garment of destiny intertwined and compassionate, such that we move beyond empathy to actually action. And when we believe all those things come together, we really see justice. So for us, uh, we are very much in tune within this space. We're hoping to bring more and more uh, conversations like this to the public, uh, to groups, because we think that will uh, spark change that we desperately need within this time. You referenced uh, the prior work as a commissioner of the Department of Human Rights. Um, one of the things which I would leave this audience uh, with is that there has been an ongoing dialogue about leadership that could be taken by a region. And in the past decade, that there have been efforts from various leaders within uh, what is referred to as the communities of color, talking about could Minnesota be the region that really becomes truly inclusive? And if it does so, it could set a standard and it could be the model for the entire world. And the question, as it was a decade ago, is to today, does Minnesota want to take on that position? Um, so we uh, know what the data is. Uh, we know that there have been uh, opportunities that have been lost. We haven't made space uh, for individuals to be truly at that table. So I'm very much committed. I know all the leaders uh, on this panel are very much committed to uh, trying to work to strive together to create that table. So I'm hopeful that we will have a productive conversation and move some things forward. Um, we can't have a situation where 4.2% of the world's population lives in the United States, but 25% of the population of people who are incarcerated are in the United States. We can't have a situation in which we're suspending uh, Native American students 10 times as often as we're suspending white students, and where we're suspending African American students eight times more likely than a white student. We can't have uh, equal pay such that um, Latino women are making about 60 cents on the dollar to white males. Uh, African-American women are making about 63 cents on the dollar to white males. We need to close those gaps. So let's uh, really lean in. Let's see um, a spirit of how we are all truly intertwined together and in that uh, destiny of um, mutual destiny uh, that Dr. King talks about. Um, and let's just stop talking about it and let's get to action. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Jamika, can you bring us into your role and your organization? Absolutely. And I too want to thank uh, the council, Dan, and others uh, for allowing me this platform. It's, it's definitely an honor. And as a transplant into uh, Minneapolis, uh, we'll get into that and in some of the further questions. I would like to also share my experience. Um, I want to see this as a, a courageous discussion. I want us to get uh, comfortable feeling uncomfortable in what we're going to talk about. I don't want this to be a superficial discussion, yet I do understand the audience. I do understand where I work, and I also understand that this is an important time for all of us as uh, Minneapolitans, uh, and, and, and not excluding uh, our, our St. Paul um, friends as well. So with that, uh, my name is Jamika Quillen. I am the Assistant Vice President of Human Resources and Inclusion at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Uh, I oversee recruiting, I oversee supplier diversity, which I know should be very important to this audience, and I also oversee just generally DNI. Um, you know, our mission is that we serve the public by pursuing a growing economy and stable financial system that works 
for all of us. Uh, it's in the fabric of everything we do. We are one of 12 reserve banks across the system. And by the system, I mean nationally, Federal Reserve System, uh, with our Board of Governors in BC, um, as many of you know, Chair Powell uh, managing uh, from that area. We uh, ensure that we supervise and regulate our, organ our banks. We um, you know, manage monetary policy. Uh, we talk about and manage financial payments and services. And within the Minneapolis Fed, we have some special entities uh, the Center for Indian Country Development, as well as the Opportunity for Inclusive Growth Institute. So as we talk about putting, you know, you know the, the term putting your money where your mouth is, I, I, I'm very, very proud of my organization, of the Federal Reserve System, and what we're doing for not only the economy, but for our community, and in particular, Minneapolis, and the work that we're doing in the indigenous populations, and ensuring that we're researching and understanding where our economic inequality is. Um, I ask that you uh, look at our website. We recently renovated our website. It's beautiful. It talks a lot about COVID-19 and what we're doing in that regard. Uh, our president, Neil Kashkari, I'm sure you've seen him in many uh, media spaces talking about our work and our effort as a collective, uh, but also um, what we're doing with economic inequality as well as, as I mentioned, um, other communities within our district. So with that, I will uh, turn it back over to Dan. Great, thanks, Jamika. Um, Liliana Maria Percy Ruiz, uh, bring us into your world. And I'm guessing for some, uh, yours may be the more curious space as far as what is on being. That's very existential. It's just a very appropriate way to, to get at the heart of our work. It's very existential. Um, but it also, you know, we, we talk about our work um, at On Being as always being surrounded by three questions What does it mean to be human? How do we want to live and who will we be to each other? So that's really at the heart of all of the work that we do in the organization. Um, so I'm the executive producer of On Being Studios and, and what that means is that I run the audio content that we produce. So that's in the On Being public radio show and podcast and uh, this movie changed me, which Dan made sure that I mentioned, which I host, <laughs> which is a podcast, as well as uh, Poetry Unbound, which is another podcast that we have. Um, but we as an organization, we're called the On Being Project, and we're an independent nonprofit media and public life initiative. And so we really take seriously those three questions that I mentioned and how they show up in our work and how we can be of service in those areas to our audience. Fantastic. Thank you, Liliana. Uh, Rosemary Aboja. Hello. Um, thank you so much um, to the Downtown Council, the East Town Business Partnership, and I'm honored to be on this panel. Um, with our other panelists here. Um, I am the founder and CEO of Nika Creative. We're a brand development firm, um, a firm that was built anchored on inclusion. So um, the idea of being inclusive is worked into how we do business, um, who we serve, and what we strive to see as outcomes. Um, just to clarify what we mean by inclusion, it's all people all the time as it relates to your bottom line, but also as it relates to the community overall. Um, to that effect, it's we can definitely be successful in business and also be great stewards of our communities at the same time. I've been in business for just over 10 years now. And um, our, our one vis um, vision is to be a role model for inclusion. It's how we do business um, and it's what we bring to our clients. So we like to say that we build inclusion um, into an organization, one brand at a time. Our work is very thorough in the brand development space. And thanks, Dan, for sort of teeing this up. We've enjoyed the work we've done with the downtown um, council, um, um, chameleon shops, and advocating to close gaps. I've also worked with um, um, former Commissioner Kevin Lindsay here a lot on different strategies to close the disparity gaps. Um, we just know, and we all know here that to be an, an inclusive world is a better world for all of us. Um, it's better for us um, just with harmony, as you can see with the past few weeks, and it's better financially. Uh, so there, there seems to be no downside to being inclusive, yet, um, we do have about 71% of organizations that strive for inclusion, but only 12 of them actually um, do the work or are able to get there. 
That's why we created Nika Creative. It's to help organizations that want to be inclusive, understand the value of inclusion, take those steps towards truly being inclusive. So we offer um, a full suite. We're a full, full brand de development shop, um, brand strategy, right? Working inclusion into the fabric of the strategy of that organization, um, brand implementation. How do we bring it to life? And then we added on brand culture because brand is not what we say. It's actually what we do. And it's what as the experience that people have with us. And in the era that we live right now, you're on Twitter as much as I am, you know, that really carries more weight, much more so than the, the great messages we put out there about ourselves or our companies. So we offer a full suite of offerings. Um, I have a vision. And I, I go, you know, I sort of dabble between optimism and not, but I still have a strong vision that Minneapolis and Minnesota can be the standard for inclusion. Um, and I would work with anyone who is willing to do their part to get us closer to that. And like Jamika said, we will have to be uncomfortable. And I know it's not our culture here to settle with being uncomfortable, but we certainly have to break through. We have to be courageous um, because being inclusive is very hard work. As a company that made a pledge to this just over 10 years ago, I'm speaking from experience, but it is worthwhile work. It's meaningful work. And the results are just amazing for everyone. Um, so we'll continue to stay in Minnesota and do the work. And we're open to working with anybody that wants to drive their organizations towards inclusion. So thank you for this platform and thanks for including me in this conversation. Thanks so much, Rosemary, for all of that. And indeed, please reach out to her to do some internal and external work. Uh, circling back to Kevin with a little bit more of a focused question now, and you sort of just tee this up um, as you uh, were framing your opening comments but particularly looking over the long arc of Minnesota history and your work as the State Commissioner of Human Rights, I mean, what are the pressing questions like, I mean, we know the data, you help lead everybody in, we have studies, like what are the pressing questions you wanna ask the business community now that actually have been there, but maybe ears are open a little bit more in this moment? Yeah, I think, thank you, Dan, for that question. I think one of the things for the business community to really look at is the diversity inclusion equity effort still separate and apart as something or is it truly embedded within so that it becomes the way in which you do business all the time um, we have been dancing kind of around this respective question um, if i were to look at data concerning hiring of diversity and inclusion uh, positions within organizations two years ago you do see an increase in the number of companies hiring diversity and inclusion consultants but when you do that same survey to those diversity and inclusion consultants between 60 75 percent of the time they are under resourced not financially resourced the way they need to be and they are understaffed given the size of their respective organization so in essence you brought one person in and given them this big issue not giving them really the resources to be successful and they are charged with framing the overall communication strategy for the organization and it's not tied so to rosemary's point it reminds me of something the uh artist james baldwin says i can't hear what you say because i watch what you do so people are watching and when you don't communicate it with ceo you don't tie it with resources you've told you've told me volumes right as to how serious you are about it so yeah so when I, I i talk about like the suspensions one uh presenting that data how intentionally are we we talk about the most important factor for a child's success is them being in the classroom everybody agrees so how can it be that we are suspending students at such a disproportionate rate beyond the national standard and then when you look at the data concerning the explanations given, how is it possible that we're suspending students 20%, 20 times more likely for a Native American student to be suspended for tobacco use than a white student? 20 times. 
what what can pass what possible explanation? We got to dig deep, own up that to that uh, that data. Thank you, Kevin. I, you're really talking about in things that you might say, well, that's kind of granular, but in fact, those are pivotal. The education and the cultural competency of leaders, regardless of race, are telling us to the biases and the implicit biases that we're bringing into all of our spaces. And when it comes to the framework of our corporate culture, um, to make this everyone's work is, to me, what seems like the biggest opportunity and the biggest challenge. We don't have just a department but it's everybody's work because this is our world. Uh, thanks for framing that up. Jamika, you, you're from Chicago. Like you said, you're sort of a new person and in our interaction and stories like there's been some really hard moments you've experienced that have been telling to you. So in this moment with the killing of George Floyd, I mean, how have you professionally and personally experienced this community trauma and, and the protesting and all that's been going on? Thank you, Dan. And, and I want to just let the, everyone know that Dan has really been, I know he's said we are mentors to him, but he's really been a mentor to me. Uh, so I joined uh, Minneapolis St. Paul in uh, April of 2019. So I've been a, a, a native here for, well, a transplant, I should say, for a year. Um, my first night uh, coming into the city, I have an apartment in a city, so, uh, West Side City of, the, of, of Minneapolis. And a woman greeted me at the door, not of color. I was looking to get to my property manager so that I could get my key to my apartment. And as the woman opened the door, I'm just fresh out of the airport with my two bags. She says, you're not here to rob us, are you? And that was my welcome to Minneapolis. And so when I think about George Floyd, um, I want to just honor uh, some of the statements that I was really proud to hear from our leadership. Not only my leadership, and I'll get into that in a second from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and really across the system as this had become more of a global um, unrest. But, you know, Mayor Jacob Fry, you know, immediately stating being Black in America should not be a death sentence. Thank you, Mayor Fry. I appreciated him specifically mentioning Black America. Because in many instances, George Floyd was not just within Minneapolis, but it is a pervasive issue across the country. And as of late, we're still seeing some of those instances happen. Um, Governor Walls, you know, when I, I was in the city last year, I had an opportunity of hearing him speak. And he said, you know, you may not come for the weather, but you stay for the values. And coming from Chicago, there's always this joke about, you know, who has the coldest winter? And I cannot honestly attest, I am not moved by Minnesota winters. So I, I've, that hasn't like moved me at, at this point. But one thing that I really appreciated about what he said more recently during his press conferences was that, you know, Minnesota is one of the best places to live if you're white. And we need to sit in, we need to sit on that and we need to really think about what that is saying about our city. Because I will say coming from Chicago to Minneapolis, the inequities from a class standpoint is striking, particularly when you're a person of color and there aren't as many people of color in Minneapolis as there are in Chicago. So you're looking for those opportunities to network and build um, companionship and really build um, an anchor to keep you in the city. Um, so for Governor Walls to say that, I thank him for that. And then uh, I want to also acknowledge Peter Frost from the Greater MSP. He had sent out a statement. I've been close to Greater MSP. I think it's a great organization to help people like me come into the city, meet other people of color, and really get connected to what Minneapolis-St. Paul has to offer. And when he said, you know, Mr. George Floyd was a newcomer to our region, he moved here five years ago from Houston, Texas, seeking opportunity. This community failed Mr. Floyd, absolutely. And that was the first statement in, 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 his, um, in his mention of, of the incident, among other um, areas where we can you know, connect and collaborate. And really that's, that's what's important. Um, we need to, as a city, understand where we are as it relates to the cult cultural norms of the city. I'm still learning the cultural norms of the city. And I don't know if many of you know, but there are books uh, that talk about how to be a transplant in Minnesota. What does Minnesota nice really mean? Uh, and, and, and so I think um, 
it, it, it is a place where there are great disparities, but as I've said before, there are great opportunities. There are remarkably talented individuals in this city of, of color in particular, Black especially. And, um, you know, as I've talked with Dan and others, and we've talked about, you know, where do we go from here? Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, you know, and Rosemary as well, the outlines are there. Why it has taken the death of George Floyd to now reimagine what we've already been talking about for many, many years and really for decades is something that, again, we need to be comfortable getting uncomfortable. We need to sit in that and understand why. Uh, what I will say for the Minneapolis Fed, um, similar to George Floyd, he came from Houston to Minneapolis for a greater opportunity. So did I. I came to the Minneapolis Fed uh, for a promotional opportunity in diversity and inclusion, working for two phenomenal leaders who I have great respect for and who, if you, you know, they walk, the, they walk the, what's the term, they, they walk the talk. I mean, they're all about accountability and ensuring that we represent the communities that we serve. So we're not looking to create new things. We already had a framework in place. Our DNI strategy is strong. We are actively out there looking for people of color to ensure that we are meeting the, the moving the needle, meeting the labor market availability of people of color in our community, not only from a demographic standpoint, sexual orientation standpoint, also from a supplier diversity standpoint. And so we are continuing to keep the course and uh, with our leaders at the top, uh, really making that stance and saying we're holding one another accountable to ensure that we, we do this collectively. It has, what this incident has happened is just reinforced our commitment to ensuring that um, we work for all and that we are an organization that is a great place for everyone. Thank you, Jamika, <clears throat> for all pieces of that. Um, and I'm grateful that you appear to have a desire to stay and remain and be a part of the change that's so desperately needed. Turning to Rosemary, um, Rosemary, so as a professional woman of color coming from a particular culture, how do you understand the various lenses from which diverse cultures of color understand this moment? And I'll just let you kind of take it from there because I think you bring some really unique perspectives for us to hear. Yeah, um, and just to give some perspective, I moved to America in 1997. I've only lived in Minnesota <laughs> um, since I've moved. Um, but I, I moved from England, London, England, but I am of Nigerian heritage. So it's important to understand the lens that I'm bringing to this conversation. Um, while I very much feel more and more like a Minnesotan every day, I um, still realize I'm an out, I have an outsider perspective because um, there are things about the Minnesota culture that still surprise me. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, so bringing that to, to this table, I would tell you just from my personal experience for starters, when I moved to America, all I knew about America was from the movies and we all know how they portray people of color. Um, when I moved here, my parents' biggest concern one of the concerns were police because they carry guns. And this was before we had, this is 97. Because um, in England, they carried batons. <laughs> I, did, I never saw a gun until I came to go to the U here. Um, and then also, there was a notion um, about, there's a, a class structure between me as an immigrant of African heritage and African Americans that are here. That's what we learn through media. That's what's fed to us. But when I, so when I got here, um, January 3rd, 97, um, dead of winter, I enrolled at the U on the 6th. And as soon as I got to the counter, I was told to go to the African-American department and register there. I think there was an African-American council or so. And I had this whole banter with him that I'm not African-American, I'm an international student. You see, I did not know what it meant to be African-American. I didn't know it was just another term for being a black person. Um, so we went back and forth and I just kept saying, I'm paying international fees. I, my nationality is not American or African-American. It took me three months to understand what that meant. And it was at that point that I chose to educate myself. There is an assumption that we have here that the rest of the world learns 
American history. We, we really don't. We learn the history of the place that we come from and our neighbors, because that's what's most important to us. So we have a lot of people of color here, immigrants, that also don't know the history. I liken myself to someone who is cashing the checks of African American ancestors. What they, the framework that they set down is what I get to benefit from. And it's very important to note that on a number of levels. One, I've come in with a strong desire to attain the American dream. And I haven't come in with the trauma and the hangups of being able to attain that dream. So there are certain things I'm pushing forward because I don't know any better. I have not been conditioned to know my place. I really have no clue. I'm just going forward with what I want and I don't understand why I won't get it. But it's very important to understand the history of trauma. Um, I've, I've understood more about it through my own self-education, my curiosity, and my daughter, who's an American citizen's experience. And I say this to the business community, because we have all these equity programs and we, we come up with statistics and say, oh, look at our equity hires, for lack of a better term. But in that same bucket, we include women. We include white women. When we get to the next bucket, we just have, it's just called black or African-American. We don't really look at, okay, is this a new American? Is this an African-American? And that's detrimental to our progress in equity. I've done um, a lot of the work that we do really somehow harkens back to what are the gaps. During COVID, um, my firm, we just knew that those who will be the hardest hit will be the people of color. So we set to work to create a program, an outreach program to reach people who are underreached, typically. And the data for a whole week, I cried every day I looked at the numbers. Because the data I'm looking at splits up immigrants from African Americans and from other people of color. And when we look at the data of African Americans in our state, 50% of African Americans still live at or below the poverty line. 50%. When we purge that data out and look at West African immigrants, they're way above the poverty line. So I just, when we talk about equity in our organizations, we've got to break it down further. As a woman of color, my experience as a business owner is different from a white woman's experience. I'm not saying it's it's different bad or different good, but we have to acknowledge the nuances and those differences if we're truly going to be equitable in our endeavors, if we're truly going to be inclusive. Because to use a broad brush and say, well, even the universities, right? Um, the statistics for the, um, who attends college here. Oh, we've got more black people attending college. Well, let's break it down further. There's a whole group of people that we are forgetting because that, um, that education disparity gap still exists. See, my daughter is, a, is privileged because I come from a lineage of educated people. So when the school was not doing right by her, I was at the school every day. We can't say the same for a lot of people in our community right now. So I just say, as businesses look at their inclusive plans and their strategies, you've got to be willing to break it down further. Um, if you're looking at strategies to hire more women, well, maybe parse it out. Let's look at hiring more women of color, right? Um, when you're looking at who you're promoting, yes, how do you promote and say, okay, how well are we doing with promoting people of color and women of color? The broad brush does not work, is what I'm saying. And I, even from my own community, I'm very happy to see, sad that it took a, another life loss for almost nine minutes on camera to actually see people from my community. Um, and I say that as a Nigerian, British Nigerian community, actually go, wow, we need, to, we, we need to be on the front lines of this fighting for this too. 
And it could also be just our age. We now have children born here, so it's more important for us too. Um, but I like to, I, I'm glad to see people coming together more. Um, but I just want to make that point. So use the broad stroke for, all, like, for diversity. You have to break it down because we really have to start seeing the needle move in, with our Native American communities. We have to see the needle move with our African American communities. And we have to see the needle move for our um, Hispanic communities in Minnesota um, if we're going to overcome these disparities. Rosemary, that's a powerful word with so many layers to it. And before turning to Liliana very quickly, I just want to comment that probably with, a, with, a, with, with equal force, all who would consider themselves a part of the white construct and whatever white has become need to do that same work in that direction. How did white become white in America over 400 years? And just as we individuate across cultures to the various uh, identities now, uh, how did this happen? And, and, and really go back and see there's some things to deconstruct in the whole idea of white and what that means. Uh, turning to Liliana, um, your story is rich, your work at on being is so helpful across so many sectors. I mean, recently I heard an economist on your show, but maybe start personally. Uh, how have you experienced this moment personally and professionally? And I know you're a transplant to Minnesota as well. I actually wish I had got one of the books to Mika mentioned <laughs> when I moved here. Um, and I just want to say, Rosemary, thank you for what you just said, because I feel like you're speaking to a lot of the grief I have as a, a white Colombian. Uh, you know, I, I often am I'm kind of put in these box of Hispanic, Latino, Latine, whatever name you want to use. And moving to Minnesota has been hugely important to me to recognize that the privilege that I have by being white. And that's a privilege that my fellow brothers and sisters from my community don't have when they're brown or they're black. And how much education, as you were speaking to it, really factors in as well. Um, and I just really, I'm just so grateful to you for saying all the things you said. For me, my experience has been really an immigrant experience. Um, I was born in Colombia and, and I came to Miami when I was four with my parents and my parents were the kind of immigrants who did not want us to assimilate. And so we were really raised Colombian and we were fortunate enough to live in a city like Miami where Colombians are a majority. And so if you go to Target, you speak Spanish. Like it's unlike any other part of the country. And so I didn't actually know what it was like to be um, other until I left Miami after college. And it was a huge discovery for me that my, my fellow people of color are having an entirely different experience in this country. And Minnesota has been central to my own exploring of my own privilege and the way in which my passing um, as white and being white in all the ways that that means um, has really opened doors for me in ways that I never could have imagined before. So it seems really strange to say it, but it wasn't until I came to Minnesota that I realized I was white. <laughs> because uh, you know, in Miami, you identify by country of origin. You say, I'm Cuban, I'm Colombian, I'm Nicaraguan. You don't even talk about race. And what this, this uh, murder of George Floyd has brought about in my community and my family has been those uncomfortable conversations that Jamika called out that we are now having for the first time uh, about the ra racism that exists, the systemic racism that exists in our own countries, and in my case, Colombia, and how by choosing to live here, it is our problem, and we need to educate ourselves to this country's history, um, even if it doesn't look like what we experience in our Latin American countries. So I've been having a lot of wrestling with, with these questions that I'm embarrassed to say, you know, we never talked about it in my family. We never talked about it because we so identified with being immigrants and forgot that we became citizens in 2000. Like we, we claim this country too. So it's, it's been really helpful personally to, to have these conversations, even if they can be frustrating and hard at the same time. Um, and then professionally, you know, we've been listening to uh, our audience really carefully right now. Um, you know, since the pandemic began, uh, but especially in the wake of George Floyd's murder. Uh, we've really been listening to our audience, which, which is a full spectrum of human experience. It's black, it's white, it's brown. Um, and we've been really thinking through what we can provide. And so a recent interview that we did with someone from Minneapolis, a trauma specialist, therapist, Res Menicum, that show has been the most popular thus far of the year. And it's really because he addresses 
what it's like to be a black body and the work that needs to be done for white people, for black people, the work we need to do with each other. And I think moving forward, that's gonna be our commitment and our content. We're just really thinking so thoughtfully about how we can amplify the voices that need to be heard right now um, and how we can use our platform to do that. Thank you. Um, I just want to be cognizant a little bit of the time as we go around the next uh, series of questions. And this is just this is for everybody. This is largely about us listening to these leaders. So if we have time for Q&A, great. If we don't, that's OK. Um, it, because it's your voices we want to be most trained upon. So um, as I move back to Kevin again, you're now the CEO of Minnesota Humanity Center. How do you see all facets of our humanity coming into play in this moment? Because humanity centers like religion, education, social network, like you're really, you move to the humanity side of things. Just bring us into that and some reflections that'd be helpful for the business community. Sure. So that piece about sort of understanding history that has now started to be part of this conversation, the humanities is very much centered in that. So uh, last week, we had a TPT live stream event with a media loft talking about the 100th commemoration of the lynchings in Duluth. And one nugget of history that was given by Dr. Bill Green from Augsburg, and I would offer him uh, as someone as a resource to anyone within the audience, is that the birth of a nation, uh, I'd love to ask you know, how many people know what the movie A Birth of a Nation is about. Uh, but A Birth of a Nation was shown by the Minneapolis superintendent of schools, and it was portrayed as an accurate reflection of history, um, which to me was mind-boggling, um, because in, in essence, that set a course as it relates for all those students of sort of how to understand black and brown bodies at that time. Um, and I, I don't think... First off, I'm not sure how many people really know the impact of a, the movie A Birth of a Nation, sort of really uplifting, uh, showing in a positive light uh, the formation of the Ku Klux Klan, and the fact of this movie being shown in the White House by Woodrow Wilson, um, and then also it being supported uh, as truth uh, going forward, how devastating that was. Um, so the space that we're in with the Humanity Center, it's talking about how systems operate one another together. It talks about uh, these concepts and, and ideas and hopefully creates a platform for moving change going forward. I've teased out a little bit about criminal justice reform, but I, I wanna go and tie to sort of what Rosemary said. So again, I had given you that fact earlier, 5% of the population but 25% of the world's population is incarcerated here. If you take a look at the majority of individuals who are incarcerated, vast disparities concerning black and brown bodies. If we talk about marijuana use, white Americans actually smoke more marijuana on average than black and brown people, but we are far more disproportionately arrested, uh, prosecuted, and convicted for possession uh, than for marijuana. How does that play to the business community? You, we have enacted more than 50,000 collateral consequence laws which prevent individuals from ever getting back into society, right? So this is an important issue for the business community if you really are talking about making a positive economic difference for the African-American community, for the Latino community going forward. Um, so please lean into this, look at your respective data. We are still denying people opportunities for jobs in which there really is no legitimate risk at all because we don't disaggregate the data. I could say volumes more on sort of what Rosemary said concerning disaggregating data from my time as a commissioner of human rights and looking at and reviewing state contracts. Oftentimes they would write down, they would say they were gonna go see a college or talk to a college. We'd go and ask them, I was didn't know that. Uh, never heard from them, not connected to it. Or the idea of promotion practices, great disparities uh, as to what is given to Rosemary versus what is given to Liliana as it relates to opportunities going forward. It's just never been a priority. I would say going forward, hopefully that we see this as an opportunity to really value everyone 
and that we bring much more intentionality to mentoring every person. The region that mentors every child and really gives them an opportunity to succeed, they don't just win the next 20 years, they win the next 100 years. And the question is, are we willing to do that? Or is racism or colorism going to stand in the way of that? That is really uh, incredibly detailed, uh, Kevin. Thank you on so many levels. Um, Jamika, so you live in the land of data. I mean, the Fed Reserve has become really engaged in disaggregating and being very poignant. But I guess pivoting more to some of the ways that you've worked internally, can you just share... So how do you work with Fed Reserve employees? And this is sort of to a mirror of uh, some folks who on this webinar like lead companies and lead employees or come from HR departments. Like how have you now led conversations in this moment to, I mean, what does it mean disaggregate data to HR departments? And how are you leading the Fed Reserve to really operationalize this meaningfully? No, I just want to say what Kevin said was powerful. And if I had a mic, I would drop it. Um, you know, data is extremely important. And so the one thing I know I mentioned our website earlier, but I encourage those who've not visited our, our website to go to MinneapolisFed.org. Uh, you want to see data, uh, comprehensive data on not just our DNI efforts, but supply diversity efforts, uh, COVID-19, and many of the uh, matters that we oversee, please go in and look and you'll learn a lot. Um, as it relates to how we've been managing our staff and leaders through this time, I have to admit that having employee resource network groups has been instrumental in helping us move this forward. Um, we have a mental health alliance organization that even pre-George Floyd was in place to support us from a mental health standpoint um, through COVID, you know, working from home. I mean, so there have been many uh, ways in which we've been leaning on our ERNs to support us um, to, to get through you know, much of what's been going on with COVID, because I know, uh, you know, pre-George Floyd, I mean, we've been dealing with racism, but I want to also acknowledge for our Asian and Asian American communities and colleagues, you know, many of our colleagues' families were dealing with xenophobia due to the pandemic. And so our Asian affinity group um, had some, brought in some speakers to speak specifically to the, the group and membership, but also to talk about as a bank, what can we do to support our communities and how can we move through this? Uh, with George Floyd specifically, what has been unprecedented um, and has now become more of a, um, a global or national standard with our reserve banks is our president, first vice president, put forth a, forth a statement rebuking um, racial intolerance. And that was unheard of. And so that really set a great um, sense of encouragement uh, to the staff, which then followed up with a town hall that featured our African-American senior uh, most executives and African-American men inclusive of African men and females who shared their experiences about being black in America as well as Minnesota. It was humbling, it was eye-opening, and it really um, helped pave the way for many of those courageous conversations that we've all been talking about. We even had a, a, a supply drive for many of the communities that were impacted by um, the effects of the unrest in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, and so our, our volunteer organization helped to pull that together immediately following the town hall, which was actually that, that Saturday. Um, we continue to have the conversation. I think one thing we need to be really mindful of is that this is not a one and done. I think that's come up in conversations. We need to continue to have the discussion. So we will have continued discussions, as Kevin even mentioned, um, mental health discussions specifically on handling trauma. This uh, specific incident, unlike many others, was extremely traumatic. From beginning to end to see the life of George Floyd leave himself, you know, leave himself. Um, and for those who watch the video, I, I can't. Uh, I, I to, just quickly, my mother passed away in December uh, and to hear him call out for his mother was an extremely traumatic time for me. And so we are bringing in professionals to help our staff, you know, have those conversations. Uh, we're also going to bring in discussions around economic inequities uh, so that we know, to Kevin's point and others, what are we really dealing with in the community? I mean, we put the data out there, but do our staff really have a meaningful understanding of that? We're going to have that conversation. And then finally, we're gonna have some small group discussions just to continue to have courageous discussions around um, a myriad of topics, uh, but definitely around racial um, equity. Thank you, Jamika. Uh, I see Kevin's hand. I was gonna to go to, do you wanna add something to that? 
if I could, concerning that piece about uh, trauma, just because lynchings were not talked about in school does not mean communities of color weren't talking about it. So again, in the TPT uh, presentation that we did, Dr. Green talked about, Dan Bergen from TPT talked about African-American communities bring newcomers coming into town, being ushered into a private room, and hey, I want to make sure you know that there was a lynching here in Duluth. And 10,000 people were in the streets, and no one was prosecuted for that murder. So that was still being talked about. And by the way, those lynchings, that was a photograph. People stood around the bodies. So again, if we think about the lynchings from the, the summer of 1919 and going forward in the frustration of a lynching law uh, by our very own Roy Wilkins between, before FDR, uh, FDR in 1934-35, trying to move that forward and the current frustration of lynching. This is a long time coming of something which, we, why are we even having this conversation, right? There's a devastating impact of emotional trauma for the African-American community in and around this issue. That's all. Yeah, it's like a bell curve of intensity um, and, and overburden. Thank you, um, Kevin. Uh, we're going to go just a couple minutes long today. This is remarkable content, and I do want to hear from uh, Rosemary and Liliana on just a couple more questions. So, Rosemary, uh, and as we've been in the circle with the inclusion practitioners, it's like, what can we say to white colleagues? And this is to me and me to other white colleagues, and maybe particularly because in the marketing space, communication space, what would you say to that space and maybe to the business world in general? Yeah. Um... We've seen a lot of, I've gotten a lot of emails <laughs> about people um, sort of empathizing, uh, com making a commitment to do better um, since the tragedy of um, the loss of George Floyd happened. Um, it, I, I, I am glad to see this renewed commitment to it, but I just urge that it's just not another um, checkbox activity, um, that we actually take action um, I say action with air quotes, really. It should not, the action should not be performative, right? When you decide as an organization to take action towards being inclusive or becoming an equitable organization, you have to have the idea of what impact you're hoping to see. It has to be measurable. Who is the beneficiary of this action you're taking? What does it really do to advance the cause? Um, so before the next email goes out with a promise of commitment, it's actually okay to say we're working on figuring out what it is than to leave us hanging just saying we're committed because my next question is how? What are you going to do and who's the beneficiary, right, um, of that? So. It's taking action. Now at Naked Creative, we have what we call the seven tenets of inclusion. Um, I'll just read through them. That's our guiding principle. That's, the, that's what we, um, the principles we use to create and work with our clients. The first is curiosity. This is listening without judgment, right? So let's start that on an individual level. Let's start that with our teams. Let's start that without, uh, with, outside of our immediate networks. Um, and as we listen and are curious, empathy. Are you trying to understand the other person's point of view or are you working on your rebuttal, <laughs> right? So you've got to drop that defensive stance and just be empathetic. Even in my own story, I am working because I have empathy at this point to the plight of people of color who were here long before I was in Minnesota and America. And then there's um, another tenant is nuance. What is it that we don't know we don't know? So that when we do hear it, it's a big aha moment and acknowledge that aha moment. Acknowledge you've made a shift. Share that idea of that shift. And whatever you come up with, whatever statements you're making, whatever action steps you're taking, you've got to make sure it's believable. 
it has to pass the sniff test, right? You can't just tell us you're committed, but everything else you're doing isn't. If you follow Twitter like I do, people are getting called out for these superficial commitments every day. Take action, walk the talk. Um, I can't tell you, almost uh, all um, surveys with CEOs, C-suite, they talk the talk of inclusion, but when we go down to mid-management and to the people on, you know, on the ground, it does not filter down because there's no meaningful action. So it's, very, it's a great statement for you know, a keynote um, speaker, but it's not really coming to light. So you have to take action. And then respect. That's the one value we have at Naked Creative. You cannot have inclusion without respect. It's not gonna happen. Respect different points of view, respect different ways of life. Um, I, I, I was saying out there, bring your whole self to work. Understand that if, if our whole selves are not respected, <laughs> right? We can't bring our whole self to work. So when you start demonstrating respect, you create this safe environment for people to really bring their whole self and give you their best. And then seek true transformation, deep, true transformation. What have you shifted? What paradigms have shifted by doing this work? Um, so that's what I have to put out there. And like I said before, none of it is easy, but it's necessary. Um, so the seven tenets of inclusion, um, if you follow that, you'll be taking steps in the right direction. Rosemary, that's incredible. And I just want to say to everybody, uh, as you do that work, it's not performative. It's incisive. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Liliana, and this will sort of wrap up uh, in this. And, and one of the reasons why I personally love On Being is it's an incredible resource across multiple disciplines and sectors and ways of being um, the show and your team has produced a lot of content. I mean, what are the, what are the things, the topics and, and all those voices, how can they inform this moment? And I just, that's a very general and broad question, but I know your team sits and works on content uh, that can be helpful to the business community. And so just top line, what are a few uh, specifically leaders of color that you've interviewed that, that provide ways to understand this moment? Yeah, um, I just spoke about Resmo Menicum, who is local here and um, working on trauma in particular in the Black community, uh, including with police officers. And we're actually interviewing, we interviewed him again alongside Robin D'Angelo, who's really speaking to white, the white people in this country around white fragility. She has a sold out book <laughs> that has been uh, uh, being searched for all over the internet at this point. Um, and the two of them in conversation, because the two of them had done a lot of work together around the importance of, of the nuance that Rosemary talks about when you have these kinds of conversations and also the action that we're all kind of calling out. Like, okay, we have these conversations, but what's next? And what does this actually mean to hold ourselves accountable and hold each other accountable? And so we're really thinking through that in our content. Um, when I say that we're listening to our audience, I mean, our audience is emailing us, our audience is on social, our social media platforms. They're letting us know what they want to hear. Um, they're also holding us accountable for the, the ways in which we're still learning publicly. And so we're, we're doing a lot of that internal work uh, as producers, um, as staff members in this organization, and then really thinking through how does that show up in the content? We're being incredibly thoughtful. And um, as Rosemary said, we're really listening. We're just really listening to try to understand how we can serve our community and our audience. And we're going to continue to see that reflected in the guests that we choose moving forward. Thank you. And that phrase that stuck out in a gripping way is learning publicly. Wow, how do uh, small, medium, and large organizations, whether it's nonprofit or corporate or whatever, learn publicly when ideally we've all tried to come at the marketplace with strength and we have this and I guarantee you if you do this, and it feels to me like there's a lot of invitations in that, that in the short term can be very uncomfortable, but in the long term strength comes and you've all talked about this. It comes from engaging with a wider set of lenses that builds a better marketplace and informs us to be more complete people, more complete leaders, more complete organizations. Well, we need to wrap up. Uh, so much gratitude to all four of the panelists who have participated. Thank you to the several hundred who've jumped in on the webinar, and we will hold this recording. Uh, and I encourage you to spread this to your employees 
to anyone in your networks because what you just experienced was like a veritable feast of wisdom, incisive knowledge, lived experience, embodied and representational leadership from a state level in, into even humanities and a very human level. And so uh, I am privileged to have had these four here and I know we all are. Uh, again, follow up with us as this will come and be sent to you and it'll be posted on our YouTube channel. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, have a, a, a good week and a good month and a good year. And may we all together move into all of these conversations in, in, with courage and with clarity to actually, and this has been said across all of the panelists, to make Minnesota an example of how we can learn publicly and do better and become something that is different than what has played out over the last many decades of our history. Thank you everybody, have a great day, take care, and let's stay in touch.